for our last talk of the morning. We're shifting gears from the um, Odo side to a different talk. We have Dr. Robin Berger here to talk to us about functional disorders. Um, he's a psychiatry resident and very excited that he could join us today. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, so I'm one of the, our two residents in psychiatry. I'm originally from Scotland. I'm a child adolescent psychiatrist originally, but I'm retraining here because I have to. Um, my wife is from Seattle and persuaded me to move here. Um, I wanted to share with you some insights into functional disorders. And I'm using that in the widest sense. We'll come back to terminology a bit later on. Um, things I found helpful, um, particularly in consult liaison psychiatry, where we deal with this kind of difficulty frequently. Um, I hope that we can give you some, well, I can give you some skills in just feeling attuned to psychological aspects of illness. Let's say you're sitting in clinic and you're, you're picking up on this, but you're not sure what to do about it. And I just want to give you some skills in kind of identifying it when it's going on and knowing a little bit what to do if you do identify it rather than sitting and feeling uncomfortable about it. So hopefully we'll achieve that. Um, so I hope to go through the first two learning objectives relatively quickly and then spend most of the time on the more practical aspects of this. Um, I have here a picture of Antiochus who was a Greek prince who was given the diagnosis of being in love with his stepmother which cured him, his mysterious illness, and he went on to marry her and have several children with her. So this idea of a mismatch between the impairment caused by a symptom and um, what could be going on biologically or psychologically is not a new concept. It's been there for thousands of years. So I'm gonna have a picture of Descartes, to think about the mind-body problem, but I'm not gonna spend more time than that on it. I wanna paint a picture of you, or to you, about a young woman that I met last year. Um, she was a frequent attender to hospital who was admitted to a medical service with abdominal pain. Um, she had a long history of recurrent pancreatitis and chronic pain, was open to the pain team, had a pain plan, and came in, she was quite sullen, she was demanding opiate analgesia, which she got because that was her pain plan. Um, there was already a vibe in the team around her within nursing staff who knew her well of frustration and an apparent mismatch. She would sit in bed playing video games and demand this, demand that, but did not appear to be in as much pain as she said. Um, an interesting case, you know, her mother was an IV drug user. She was in the care of her maternal grandmother who was dotingly sitting at her side. This painting demonstrates it perfectly. Um, and advocating for her to have more pain relief. Um, any attempt to talk, psych think psychologically with her was met by a huge amount of resistance. And even um, aggression, verbal aggression is the wrong word for it, but just you'd basically be sent packing out of the room by both her and the grandmother. Um, and that had been a difficulty with the, the pain team as well as an outpatient. This problem had been so significant that she, she had not been at school since the age of 12. Um, whereas her identical twin was now at college, was doing well, was social, had a friend group. This patient, um, had her world had kind of shrunk in around her. Um, I will say just from a medical perspective, there was ambiguous evidence of pancreatitis. Her lipase was just above the range, no imaging um, that was consistent with it. She had symptoms. There was a lot of disagreement and splitting within the team about what the diagnosis was. Now a quick poll, don't think too much about it. Is this mainly biological or mainly psychological? If we could just do the poll now. I just want it just to get people thinking. Just go with your first instinct. Are the results going to magically come up? Yeah, I'll show them in a second. I'm just gonna give people a few more seconds to okay. vote. Pretty good participation so far. Neat. So if you've already polled, okay. So it's mainly psychological, great. Okay, so maybe I'm preaching to the converted, but also what I want to get you to think about is that this is not an artificial 
all or nothing thing. It's not either psychological or biological. And I'm glad there was a bit of disagreement there as well. Um, we often think that it's our job to, to fix it if it's biological and if it's psychological all in the head, then it's not our problem. It's not owned by GI or it's not owned by medicine. It should be psychiatry. And patients often pick up on this too. Now, just to kind of, I don't know if you guys are good at shouting out and speaking, but what kind of things might be maintaining this problem? I don't know if anybody wants to hazard a guess. The attention she's getting from her family for it. Attention, yeah, exactly. And that was indeed a case, you know, so the, from the grandmother, um, they were kind of locked into each other. Um, yeah, or lack thereof. So she had fallen out with her friends, you know, or become distant from them. Anything else? Having uh, a twin that she's contrasted with. Say that again? Having a twin that she's constantly being compared and contrasted exactly. with. Exactly. In relation to the twin, she was a failure. Um, she didn't say that, but one could imagine it. And also, life um our world is so complicated that young people grow up into the world that we've made that is it's so difficult to succeed and if if you don't do everything right and get into college one can have this overwhelming sense of that you failed that there's nothing you can do to fix it a kind of all or nothingness to it um anything else doctor's behavior towards the patient contributes ah, i'm glad you said that can you tell me more Um, uh, this is complex too, but we can certainly like reinforce, um, conceptual conceptualizations about problems <laughs> for a patient or kind of, um, uh, help kind of modify and change their understanding and we can kind of internalize things and just kind of get stuck in, in, um, ruts, so to speak, um, mm -hmm you know, have like contracts and plans that were just like, well, this is the plan and kind of keep going with that. Yeah. And who was I as an intern at that point to change the plan, right? And who was the inpatient team to change the pain plan when the pain team had a pain plan and the pain team had a pain plan because they weren't there as inpatients and were doing the best they can. So we were all split from each other. But as a system, we were maintaining this problem. If you know, um, we, as a community of healthcare professionals and hospitals are often causing harm on the long term. And that's something I'll come back to again a little bit later. There's the short term risk, but there's long term harm, you know, from an investigation. I, I'm going to do an investigation because I might be sued if I miss something, but I'm telling the patient I'm worried about it. So that could affect their long term recovery as well. Does that make sense? Anything else before we move on? Um, there's a bunch of stuff in the chat, but I'll just highlight one of the, a couple of the responses. So um, someone said, it's easier to have a unifying biologic diagnosis such as pancreatitis, which has a more discrete treatment and like a predictable mm -hmm. trajectory, as opposed to addressing like a complex psych psychosocial issue. That's exactly right. And we're more comfortable because that's what we're mainly trained in, right? So of course we're going to go to that. And technically she had pancreatitis because there was raised lipase, there were symptoms, right? But it was a little bit more, more vague than that. Um, thank you. I just wanted to get you thinking that I'm glad that's, that we, you know, so we've got kind of biological factors. I just want to add in there, you do have kind of pain amplification syndrome. You have pain, chronic pain. Depression, mood, anxiety are also factors, as well as with social, which we've talked on, and, and, met, and, and medical as well. Okay, let's move on. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, but I've tried to kind of get data from the US. A lot of the research on this is from Europe, and it's sometimes called medically unexplained symptoms. Um, we'll come back to terminology later. Um, but basically, it's prevalent, it's costly, it's treatable. And this forest plot here on the left shows uh, a recent Cochrane review for psychological therapies for this kind of disorder. Um, and it's frequently comorbid both with psychiatric disorders such as depression and anxiety, and also with 
organic disorder. So no longer do we have this world where it's either biological or psychological. Actually, we realize that functional or medically unexplained symptoms often coexist with organic disease. So non-epileptic seizures are quite common in people with epilepsy, for example. Um, so we're going to start making sense of atypical illness behaviors. Um, Before I move on, any questions about what we've talked about so far? I'll take that as a no. Um, I would recommend this paper if you're interested by Kronke, um, which kind of reviews the idea of symptoms versus diagnoses and makes the point that most people have a symptom. We'll all have had some symptoms in the last week. Not all of us will go and see a doctor about it that will seek help. Those of us that do seek help, a huge chunk of us won't have any explanation, adequate explanation provided for that symptom. Sometimes this becomes chronic. And they talk about a spectrum of organic to functional. So for example, on the organic end of the spectrum, we can have something like a, bro a fractured femur. It's concrete, it's either there or it's not there. And we can move on to something like asthma causing a wheeze. We have a good mechanism for it where we do the cutoff point for when the wheeze becomes problematic is a bit more subjective. Um, we have hypertension and ADHD, which might be somewhere in the middle there. They're on a bell curve, right? And we've decided where the cutoff point is. And with hypertension, it's the hypertension is not the thing the patient's worried about. You can leave the doctor's office feeling perfectly fine and suddenly suffering from hypertension. But actually we're treating the risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease, right, and renal disease. Um, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue syndromes, moving up the, the spectrum towards functional end even more. And then at the end of the spectrum, we have kind of unexplained symptoms with some kind of dysfunctional illness behavior. And when there's a, a mismatch between the symptom and the impairment that it's causing. Good paper, recommend it. Um, a quick nod to the sick role. Um, you'll probably all have heard about kind of Talcott Parsons and his definition of the sick role, which I think is problematic, firstly, because it's kind of based on a very Western conceptualization of medicine and illness. Um, it doesn't take account of chronic disease. What about diabetes or schizophrenia? That recovery from that is a much more vague concept than being ill or better. Um, We've also got the idea of responsibility for illness. I mean, what about a smoker or, or diet or lifestyle? Um, these are all important. Um, so the sick role is really just your illness behavior in association with a symptom. Um, ab this becomes abnormal when there's um, some kind of disproportion to it. So the disproportionate functional impairment or disproportionate distress or health, health seeking behavior. Um, so again, just to think about, so you have a cough, right? You wake up Monday morning, got a busy day ahead of you and you wake up with a bit of a cough. And I just want people to shout out a little bit, what factors are going to affect, what personal factors, let's start with you, are gonna affect whether you kind of call in sick? Whether or not there's a global pandemic going on. Exactly, so COVID, yeah. Anything else? Your work culture, whether it's acceptable to call out sick or or not. Yeah. Your own degree of medical knowledge. Yeah. How often you personally experience random symptoms like a cough? Exactly. Maybe you're a, maybe you got asthma, or you're a smoker, or you're used to kind of waking up with a cough. Yeah. So your financial ability to skip work. Yeah, that's a huge one. Um, Childcare. Yeah, massive one. Okay, what's gonna affect um, you as a doctor, say you do go to the doctor, what's gonna affect the doctor's response? How, if, are they worried about this or not?
this is where we come in and can sometimes cause harm or not. So I'm going to start, I'm going to say COVID policy. Yeah, so if you're a doctor and someone comes to cough, you're going to kind of, that's going to change your behavior, right? Um, you might have been a doctor that recently missed cancer. Yeah, and you're getting sued. So you might be a little bit more likely to kind of investigate this. Yeah. So your past experience. You might have just been to a conference about rare causes of cough. Now, I'm just using this as, an, as a kind of current example, but you might have a special interest in it and, and you've trained as a hammer so the whole world is a nail, right? And we'll, we've all met clinicians like that too. Um, somehow we're punished differently as doctors for missing something than we are for over-investigating and over-treating and therefore causing long-term harm, yeah? So something about medical culture. And that differs between countries as well. Um, I'm sure you get the point, so, so, so let, let's move on a little bit um, and consider motivation. Now, I'm going to talk you through motivation because we use these words a lot, but we often think of it in a very dichotomous way. We think about kind of, this patient's malingering, right? But it's Monday morning and I've got a cough and I'm going to call in sick and get a COVID test, so I'm going to stay at home, right? Um, primary gain for me is that I'm feeling pretty stressed and um, I might have just had an argument with my partner and want to be home and, you know, be cult nurtured and kind of get back together. Um, I might have a really good book that I was enjoying. Yeah. Secondary gain is I might have been on call the next day. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get out of that. I might have um, an exam to study for um all sorts of things um tertiary gain um i might have childcare. you might this might let my wife go to work so that i can be home with the kids because they're being homeschooled yeah um so that's the gain for another person you can see how all of us have gain every patient will have a mix of these gains on a kind of spectrum or a continuum affecting how worried they are and how they respond to a given symptom yeah and being aware of all of this the complexity of it can just help you feel a little bit more clear about what's going on when you're identifying that something is truly disproportionate okay this is a busy slide you don't need to kind of understand it but um it was the best kind of recent review i could find about culture and healthcare and perceptions of healthcare. and what it talks about is that you have a complex interaction between brain, body, and behavior. And also that there is this kind of belief in medicine that it's kind of Southeast Asian cultures, um, Central South American cultures have a higher prevalence of somatization. And that actually wasn't found to be the case in, well, it was in the late 90s when they did it, but the World Health Organization did a big study on this. But what has been shown in the literature is that manifestations of things like depression can differ between cultures. So in some cultures, in Iran, where you know this study was based, or in Southeast Asia, it's not acceptable to have a mental disorder in the same way as it is, say, in the United States. And people might be more likely to present with abdominal pain or something like that. Um, it talks about how we have vulnerability factors um, which augment how we perceive a symptom like pain or tummy pain. Um, it affects how we understand what that, the meaning of that symptom is affected by culture, yeah, by our family, by our network, by our job. And whether we seek health care is affected by society as well and, and various factors that we've already discussed. Um, so it's actually, it's complex, but there are frameworks we can use to start to kind of untangle it. I just want you to kind of think about the classification, not because you need to know this, but just to, if you are seeing these patterns to know that you can, there's a name for it. And there's, this is something that a consult psychiatrist would be comfortable working with. So a somatic symptom disorder is just when there's concern about symptoms, but there's a disproportionate impairment. It's essentially what it is. Illness anxiety disorder used to be hypochondriasis. 
is a preoccupation with a specific illness that leads to either avoidance or overutilization of healthcare. Functional neurological symptom disorder is an incompatibility between the symptom and known organic disease. It doesn't mean you can't have epilepsy if you have a, um, a non-epileptic seizure, as used to be the case. It means that they can coexist, but the non-epileptic seizure needs to be incompatible with an epileptic seizure. Does that make sense? And then malingering is not actually a diagnosis in the DSM. And a factitious disorder is something that's interesting. Maybe we'll have time at the end if you have questions about it. But the difference between malingering and factitious disorder is intentionality. And it's kind of, in terms of prevalence, much lower down the kind of list of importance than these other disorders, which are hugely prevalent and prevalent and impairing. So let's move on to the third section. It's seven past, so we've got, we've got time. Um, let's try and make this a little bit more practical. So first of all, I just wanna think about language. There are lots of words out there that describe this. And I think many of these words are a manifestation of our own medical discomfort in talking about it and our uncertainty in how to talk about it with patients. And actually it just obfuscates the problem. It puts clever language often in Latin or Greek, that the patient doesn't really know what you mean, but other doctors will know what you mean. Um, I've included medically unexplained there as well, because if we're, if we're doctors, we, we should really in 2020 be thinking biopsychosocially about all diseases, um, because there's wide understanding that that's the case. And that kind of makes it not medically unexplained if you're thinking biopsychosocially. There is an explanation, but it's just not in the bio bit of it, maybe. Or maybe our understanding is underdeveloped and we will find biological causes or explanations. Functional symptoms was in vogue, is now going out of vogue, but it's, it's still there. I personally like it because there's a, I like the double meaning. It both, the, the, the symptom or the behavior can have a function for the patient. Um, and function also means that it's not working as it should. So you're being a bit agnostic. So my computer has lots of functional problems. Um, there's nothing wrong with the hard drive or the hardware, but sometimes it just does really weird things and I can't quite diagnose it. And yet it's there, it just doesn't function the way it was supposed to. Sometimes just saying what the symptom is, you know, it's a persistent symptom. Persist persistent, you know, abdominal pain. Um, the, the word disorder of brain gut interaction has kind of made its way into the Rome criteria, which is kind of the gold standard in, in GI, functional GI disorders. Um, and they're trying to get closer to the idea that this is an interaction between our mind and body. The problem is in the interaction rather than in one or the other. And then you can just say, Again, what the symptom is, it's chronic pain, it's chronic fatigue. Um, so it's, it's agnostic, but you're also giving it a label that can be used. Any questions or thoughts about that? Okay, so let's just, let, let's think about you're in clinic and you've got somebody in front of you and you, your kind of radar for a mismatch between the symptom they're reporting and your findings and their impairment is kind of that's pinging in your mind what are you going to do about it you could just send them off for a consult or send them off for some more investigations give them a medication and they might be happy for a bit but there might be a long-term pay you know cost to that so there's a very good paper by John Stone, who's, who's a neurologist, but writes a lot about um, functional neurological disorders that I think is generalizable to, across medicine. And he talks about draining the symptom dry. So truly spend time helping the patient to tell you everything about the symptom that they're worried about. It means that they're not gonna leave your appointment saying, well, I didn't tell them about X, Y, Z, so maybe I need to go back and that, that feed, that fuels their anxiety. Yeah, so if you, if you really listen to it, be careful when talking about emotional function. 
I think doing this badly is worse than not doing it at all. Um, if you suddenly, you know, they tell you about their abdominal pain and you suddenly start asking about their mood, they're going to pick up on that. And it comes back to this kind of mind-body dichotomy that we're trying to get away from. It is important, but it's important to be done well. Um, this paper talks about that in, in a bit more detail. And consider concept, context, you know, just like we've spoken about all the different games that might be at play, what's going on in society, their work, their family environment, their family culture. Um, illness behaviors are often transgenerational, right? So if your mum, when they had a headache, would take to bed for three days, you probably, you know, you might be more likely to take to, to bed for three days if you have a headache. So your illness behavior can be learned as well. It's important to neither under-investigate nor over-investigate and also to be open with the patient where you do find evidence of inconsistency because that's often what it's about is kind of sharing with the patient that there's an inconsistency between the symptom they're reporting and what you're noticing on examination be open about it rather than secretive about it. Um, when, when ordering investigations or second opinions, think about who you're reassuring. Are you actually just reassuring yourself because you're, you're not sure what's going on and you don't want to miss something? Um, what you're actually signaling to the patient is that you're worried, which will fuel their own anxiety. And then when delivering the diagnosis, you want to kind of say what they do have. Um, you want to believe, you want, to, you want them to know that you believe them. Um, be clear about what they don't have and often the list of nasty things that you're trying to exclude, just be, be clear about that. Um, if you are going to start talking about a functional disorder or somatic symptom disorder, emphasize that it's common, that we know a lot about it. It's not this mysterious unexplained thing that means that after years of investigation you're just saying, well, there's nothing we can do. That's not actually true. Um, it's reversible. Emphasize that to the patient. There's stuff they can do about it. Um, diet, exercise, working on function. What is it they want to achieve with their life? Try and identify that. Work on goals. Try and, you know, think about how the symptom is impairing, is limiting their ability to do what they want to do and work on helping them to do that. So, this kind of comes on to the principles of management, which is to first of all, be clear about what they do and don't have. Think about comorbidity and often that could be medical, but it can also be psychological. So getting consult is and psychiatry involved or psychology, rehab psychology involved early can be quite helpful. We don't do anything magical. We just sometimes have a bit more time to talk about it. Um, we formulate, we make a, a story of the difficulties that and how they emerge and why now that can help the patients make sense of what's happened. Um, and we can also treat depression, treat anxiety, and that often helps. Um, reducing medical harm is a really important factor to this because there could be med multiple providers doing multiple things. Every investigation we do will have an effect that might be long term, even if the investigation is negative, or it might incidentally find something else that wasn't actually relevant, but now becomes a, a new focus of anxiety. Know when to stop with investigations. And that's why sharing that decision, if you, if for the really complex patients that have multiple providers, multiple systems involved, um, making a shared care plan for that patient is often what protects each individual provider from feeling that well, if I miss something, I might get sued. But actually, as a group of clinicians, you're saying, well, this is reasonable to do now, and then we're going to stop. And if the patient doesn't, isn't reassured by our attempt to reassure them, then we're kind of more into the realms of mental health problem and certainly getting consult psychiatry involved would be helpful. Um, for identifying goals and, and working on that. Um, just to kind of demonstrate this, I think we have time for a bit of a breakout room. Just bear with me. What I want you to do is just spend three minutes as a group and just think about each of these points in the cycle and what we can do as 
say you're in clinic, what you can do in clinic to mitigate that, to counter that. So the patient has a tummy pain, they're worried about it, their family's worried about it, they come to you, you're not sure what's going on, but you don't want to miss anything. You investigate, but the patient's not reassured. And this cycle just goes round and round and round. And let's try having breakout groups and we'll regroup in three minutes and, and discuss it. Hopefully this works out. Yeah, it looks like people are joining their groups now. Awesome. Will, will those groups be timed? Um, yeah, we can bring them back Thanks. in a couple minutes. Okay, I've got until half past, don't I? Yeah, correct. Great, because I'm pretty much done. I just wanted to spend the rest of the time discussing. Yeah, we can even leave them in breakout rooms for a little longer if you want, whatever you think, um, but. I know breakout rooms can sometimes be too short, can't they, as well as. Yeah, we. Um... Give them till 20 past. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, sound good. Yeah, that's perfect. And I have your link, so I'll be able to put that in the chat too. When I get that. Okay. Did you say you want to give them just like three minutes? Or how many minutes did you say? It doesn't really matter. Let's give them till 20 past. 20 past? Know, so they can, yeah. Actually, nice well, I just wanted to time. say um, I, I'm one of the faculty members. I'm Hi. really enjoying your talk quite a bit. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's a bit unusual and a bit, I'm trying to pack maybe a lot of good things into not very much time, but it's kind of things I've picked up along the way that I found really helpful for myself. Yeah, I, I think know. that this is probably, and uh, Lauren can attest to this, I think this is every day in our clinic is, uh, this comes up a few times at least. Yeah, great. Well, that's, that's good that it that it seems relevant. I, I yeah. have to leave a little early, but I really just wanted to say how much I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to give them 60 seconds. Okay. Robin, I, um, I think one of the questions I know comes up in our resident clinics is the issue about access in terms of extra help. And so I don't know if there's any messages you might be able to impart to the residents about being able to do a lot of this without necessarily direct psychiatric um, yeah. help. It's, it's a challenge, certainly, in the Seattle area and, and elsewhere, too. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and touch on that. No, I can see you all starting to come back. Okay, so has anybody, I was hoping to kind of just for that to kind of stimulate a bit of kind of wider group discussion, but I think we anyone... aren't back oh. yet, Robin. To mm. oh, okay. Like... Now they're like rapidly filtering in. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I can only see a subset on my screen. I think everyone looks like they're back. They're awesome. back. Yeah. Hi there. Okay, I was hoping to just for that to like trigger a bit of a kind of wider group discussion about um this cycle and, and i wonder if anyone wants to shout out a bit about patient and carers becoming concerned what what can we do in clinic about that
We talked about how establishing a relationship with the patient and potentially going through a diagnostic process mm -hmm. initially is sort of that that building a trusting relationship is key to moving forward with this. Yeah, totally agree with that. They don't trust you. Um, and that also comes down to kind of being honest and direct with the patient. I found that that often works out really well than if I'm a bit cagey and don't quite know what to say and seem a bit evasive. And I think part of that one thing is I... Yeah. So you're breaking up a little bit there. Um, we our group, we just thought it's similar on that same vein that uh, just being open with your patients and like about like what types of things that um, you you are investigating or that have already been done, and so that people aren't confused or have related questions. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Um, one of the things I had here was also trying to identify how what they're attributing the symptom to, and it's about taking. It's just about take having the time to take the history, but actually identify attribution. Because if we think that our headache is caused by brain cancer, perhaps because my granddad died of brain cancer that was missed, right? That's kind of really useful information to have. Then if they just think they have a migraine or people with headaches are lame, so shouldn't, you know, you might have a headache and just put up with it if you think people with headaches are lame and just get on with it. But if you're worried about brain cancer, you might go and see the doctor and take time off work, right? So just that belief will change your behavior. And if we can identify that, that's, you know, awesome. Let's move on. What about um, kind of not wanting to miss anything and kind of our own uncertainty in managing that? Kind of the bit where we're part of the problem sometimes. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of ours. Oh, sorry. Oh, you can go ahead, Brandon. I was just going to say, um, I think it, and for this one specifically, it probably depends a little bit on what the complaint is, but I think this is where it's uh, very useful to kind of have frameworks for like what are like red flags things that would make me worried about something or want to pursue um, mm -hmm. invasive testing or expensive testing. Um, mm -hmm. And those are, if those frameworks exist and are well outlined, that those are things you can share with patients. Yeah, and share it with the patient. Say actually, you know, your back pain is there and causing a problem, but we've ruled out all the red flags or, or we've, there were some red flags, so we've done X, Y, Z, and you know, we've ruled out things that we need to do something about other than helping you get back to your life and coping with this symptom. Um, so it's about um, managing uncertainty. Um, so I'm not great at thinking and typing at the same time. I put here communicating with other providers as well, because sometimes you're not, it feels in clinic like you're the only one there and you're the only one dealing with the patient, but sometimes there's lots of people and speaking with them, you might realize that they're all dealing with the same anxiety or the same difficulty and connecting um, you know can, can make all of you feel a bit reassured um, what about what to do if the patient's not reassured so you've you've done all that and you've communicated um, but they're still worried about it it's still causing a problem that you know they're still wanting more referrals or more investigations I think in these situations for me, kind of um, uh, trying really hard to um, earn and like build that trust that I, I do really care about them and their symptoms and looking for scary things and like real problems and um, trying to set like 
tell them I still want to take care of them and be part of their care, but also set appropriate boundaries and say, I don't think this is the right thing or the best thing, or it could be even like risky for you for like, I can cause you harm if I, you know, lead to more like tests and, and things like that. Um, I don't know. That's really challenging. I, th I think that kind of hits a nail pretty well though. So it's about this balance between one can both validate the problem and the distress, but one can also be clear about a boundary about what's indicated and what's not indicated in this situation. And we're getting better about that with pain and opiates. Um, but we don't necessarily see yet one more MRI scan as part of that bit of kind of potential harm, you know, or something that's not particularly indicated. And it's often quicker to just submit, especially when you have 10 minutes in clinic and say, oh yeah, we'll just do it then it takes much longer to explain why you're not going to do an investigation or a treatment. Yeah. Um, I also think so, something, yeah. something I've encountered a couple of times as part of the UW system is that I get patients who come to establish with me because they want access to a UW specialist, even though the, the thing that they come to me for, I think doesn't merit that consultation that they've already had previous workup in outside systems and they want this duplication or they want this imaging or they mm -hmm. want to see UWGI or UWNT. Mm -hmm. And then that's a really challenging interaction because I'm very explicitly the gatekeeper and I don't know them and they don't know me. Mm -hmm. That's tricky, isn't it? And thinking carefully about, are you gonna, because what that's actually about is kind of wheeling out the expert who's going to come in and be definitive about it sometimes that can be helpful um, but sometimes they're still not reassured and so one has to be careful about and then they'll go to the next provider and say well i you know the world expert at the uw didn't know what was wrong with me so there must be something really wrong you know um, and that's again comes back to i think just connecting with other providers and, and making a kind of group a collaborative decision with all the people involved in their care and the patients and essentially if they're still not reassured, yeah, it's about kind of consult liaison psychiatry. So if reasonable attempts to reassure a patient that they do not have a disorder is met by further anxiety and further attempts for clarification, that's pathological. And that's where you're into the realms of the DSM and somatic symptom disorder and et cetera, yeah. And that's where having good mental health care or somebody that can kind of help guide the system and all of you um, as a group caring for the patient to kind of um, essentially it's about reducing medical harm. It's about saying this is a problem, but we're not going to continue fueling the problem. Um, does that make sense? So it's about clinicians knowing being empowered to stop when it gets really extreme. Any other thoughts about that? Robin, I have a question for you. What's, what's kind of language that you would use or advise us to use when introducing the idea of involving psychiatry in, in working up or treating a symptom like this? Mm -hmm. Really good question. And it's difficult because, especially when you can't do joint clinics, because some, you know, in some health systems, you can just see them together. And that works excellently in my, in my experience. Um, that you would have the psychologist coming in with the neurologist or the, the GI doctor. Um, I think the best way to do it is to get on board. So you've identified a goal that they might have. So actually, what this is a problem and what what is it stopping you from doing and, you know, validating distress associated with it and often trying to kind of separate the problem. You've got the symptom and then you've got the distress and the impairment caused by the symptom as two separate things. Um, we're not really sure what's causing the symptom. We have some ideas and it could be a jigsaw with a bit biological, a bit this, a bit that, but it's causing this problem that you're distressed, you're unhappy, your mood. That's where that can be a kind of way into kind of seeing a psychiatrist, which is actually say, let's think about the, the distress this is causing you. Um, maybe seeing a psychologist or a psychiatrist can help you find strategies for coping with this. Uh, for coping with the uncertainty, the effect it's having on your mood and your relationships, um, 
and that you know seeing it as just another piece of a jigsaw that we're trying everything we can all the tools we have to try and help you um can often win people over so not a dichotomous thing so i'm discharging you it's over to psychiatry but it's i'm going to keep seeing you but let's also pull in this other person who might have something to offer and then they don't feel rejected I'm just looking at the chat here as well, and I'm just kind of wowed by some of the, the great things people are saying. And I was struck by the w one person who said something about that actually doctors, we also have biases and gains. And, and that, that's so true. You know, some of us might get paid more if we order another brain scan, right? Or um, might get punished if we miss something, or um, that that's really important to acknowledge. Um, and there's so much chat here, actually, that I wish I had time to go through. I've just figured out how to open the chat field. Um, I think Lauren's been monitoring it a little bit, too. Um, any other thoughts on this before we move on? In fact, I'm just going to... Um, Co Cody said, when, when I encountered a patient that, for example, went want another colonoscopy and I explained that the IBS is biological, i.e. related to the nervous system and the gut, and then relaying it to stress hormones, etc. They have been more engaged in the discussion, probably a testament to the stigma regarding mental health. I could not agree more with that. Um, I think what you've done there is almost everything that I have been trying, that, that, that is the point, is you're acknowledging that's the problem. You're saying like, there is a problem here that, that's, that's important. Um, it's a complicated problem. Otherwise we would have a simple solution for it. Yeah. Um, it's probably a bit of lots of things that can contribute to this problem, biological, psychological. Um, you know, our gut has a huge nervous system in its own right. Um, it's so complicated. Of course, things can dysfunction. Um, our understanding is still limited. Um, but, you know, even just being open about all of that um, can just make the patient feel heard and validated and that, you know, you're not saying there's nothing wrong with them. And yes, mental health is stigmatized and hopefully that, that is changing slowly. Um, that kind of anything else just I know we've a bit over time and you guys are welcome to go. I, Lauren's just put a feedback form there. I want to make this talk better. So your feedback is really helpful for me. And I, I changed this talk based on your feedback. And it's not the most ideal feedback for this particular talk. But I think in skills that, that I've given you, I want you to have the skill to identify within yourself when this is going on with the patient because it's common. Um, so it's a skill to just be aware of it when it's there and then know that there are things you can do about it. And I think the main skill is validating the patient, thinking about gains, thinking about your role in maintaining the problem and knowing when to reach out to psychiatry. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that there's a lot of things like CBT that you can do yourself in clinics. I know access is difficult and that John Stone paper, and I'll, I'm going to send you a handout which has it, gives you a bit of an overview of kind of simple CBT skills for um, providers in clinic. Yeah. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about it. Any other questions or thoughts? I thought of one more kind of random question. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like um, I've heard a lot about how adverse childhood events um, can this I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on is that um, is that just more of an association or is there any um, like clinical utility of eliciting that history in any other way? It's a really interesting field and I think if you identify it as part of your history it's important to, to acknowledge it. But again, this comes back to kind of focusing on making the direct link to the patient can sometimes be counterproductive. Um, but if you think about, and this is a whole other lecture, 
Um, but if you think about our attachment style, the way we relate to a caregiver when in danger, when in distress, and that's what our attachment system is about. Uh, we share that with all mammals and birds. Um, is will affect how we relate to doctor to the doctor patient relationship right so if our attachment style as a child due to adverse childhood experience is disorganized and confusing and we elicit help and support in a dysfunctional way because that maybe helped us to survive growing up um, for example a caregiver who ignored you most of the time unless you escalated to the point that things were so dangerous that they then suddenly noticed you. You're going to learn that you need to upregulate every attempt of eliciting care that you can. And in adult life, you might upregulate your distress or the impairment caused by a symptom because you've learned that you need to do that in order to be heard. Yeah, that, that's just a simple example. But I think the link is your attachment style. It's much more complex than that. Um, does that that fit with what you were thinking or no it's helpful to um you know i wish i could talk more about attachment. a lot of different behaviors like, yeah, yeah no, i'd love i'd love Well, thank you everyone for coming and for the great participation during this session. Um, the link is in the chat and then um, if there's any questions feel free to chime in now, but if you need to go and get ready for clinic, um, that's also fine too. Yeah, I'll hang around if, if any of you have more questions. Um, please, please give feedback so that I can improve. <laughs>